Hello, I'm Howard Goodall and I write the music for Red Dwarf. In particular, it's a tune. Fun, fun, fun in the sun, sun, sun. And this is my studio, or part of it. Uh, this is an old-fashioned grand piano. Yeah, this is where I wrote uh, this piano. I wrote um, Tongue Tied and I wrote uh, the Red Dwarf theme. One of my rules about writing comedy theme tunes is that you don't say, I'm going to write something funny. Because, you know, there aren't many things in music that actually are funny. Um, you know... Uh, is sort of funny music. But when you're doing comedy theme tunes, really what I, my view is that they should be as if it were not a comedy. And then let the, let the characters and the script be funny. At the time that Red Dwarf was being written and touted round as an idea, I was a Nelgay artist. Uh, and Nelgay were the original company involved uh, in, in putting it on uh, with the BBC. Uh, and so they asked me whether I would have a go at the theme tune. I'd done a few comedy theme tunes by then, Blackadder and Mr Bean and various others. Um, so I wasn't totally inexperienced at, at the thing. Anyway, I got sent a script, which must have been the pilot script. Uh, and I thought uh, it had a lot of promise and um, it would be a lovely thing to do. So I had a go at some, you know, I had a chat with Rob and Doug and um, it went from there, really. Look out, eh? The slime's coming home! <laughs> I saw that first pilot and it seemed to me that um, it would be a mistake to do something that was of that moment, you know, 86 or whatever it was, that was sort of, you know, the sort of sound that you would hear in the charts that year. Or even for me to sort of twiddle around with my electrical knobs and do something on a synth that would sound what I thought was futuristic. Because two years later, it would have sounded out of date and naff and cheesy. Um, and in fact, to some extent, that is the trap that one falls into with science fiction on television. Because in terms of the visuals, um, you know, anything you're going to make that looks futuristic within five years, if this is a programme that's going to last like Red Dwarf has lasted, um, suddenly all the sort of sub supposedly modern look looks old-fashioned. I was very keen not to do something that would sound like it was the pop style of that moment. So I went backwards rather than forwards and went for a 60s, early 60s, um, Phil Spector Wall of Sound sound. And the reason I did that was because I wanted it already to sound timeless. It didn't really belong to any particular year or date or kind of chart fashion, that it would just sound like a song. Um, and I went for that big thing. And it also seemed to me that the um, big echoey sound of that, that style, where you get the, um, the bass on the piano, you double the bass on the piano, uh, this is what Phil Spector used to do. So you have the bass line, which would normally be played by a bass, which you do have a bass, but you also have... And you double that, you play it about six times on a big grand piano, and you give each one of them tons of echo. So it just fills out the sound. So it's like the whole thing's being performed in a huge, gents toilet. Uh, and that, for me, made it sound spacey, rather than f using, you know, synthesised sounds that would make it sound pseudo-modern. Because I knew you were coming along, I actually went through my archives and found my first ever pencil score of this tune, the one that I took in to the rehearsals to play them, to see what they thought of it. And there it is, look. A little bit of history there. So that, that was the first thing. Then I said, well, would you like a song? Now, if we were doing Red Dwarf now, starting it this year, 
uh, we probably wouldn't do a song. And one of the reasons for that is because of the rules about how long your music at the beginning and the end of your programme can be have changed. And in those days, you could have music at the end which was you know, over a minute long. Uh, so you actually could get a verse and a chorus in. These days, because the ruling is very strict for all programmes, because they're sold abroad and whatnot, you're talking more like 25 seconds for a theme tune at the beginning and the end, and someone's going to talk over it. It's cold outside, it's no kind of atmosphere. It's a garbage pod. <laughs> it's a smegging garbage pod. It seemed to me that what really cried out from uh, the interaction between Lister and Rimmer was the fact they didn't want to be there, uh, they were stuck out in space. And in those days, Lister spent a lot of time going on about wanting to be somewhere nice in the sun. Fiji, I think it was, was his chosen destination. Um, and that was really where he wanted to be, not stuck in a mining ship. I did write the lyric for that song, yes, although I, was, I think I was expecting them to come back and say, well, now here's an improved version, can you do that? Um, but they seemed to like what I'd already done and didn't seem to want to mess around with it at all, so it was left like that. Um, I mean, I did it kind of as a guide, really, to see, well, is this the sort of thing you're after? So I was delighted when they said, yeah, that'll do, and we'll go on and do it. I mean, later, uh, you know, when we came to write songs in the programme thereafter, uh, they would always do a lyric and I would just set it to music. Now, I actually found some old um, lyrics for the Red Dwarf song. This was the original sheet of lyrics that I did, and I did um, five verses, of which we only used two. So I thought you might like to hear the ones that never made it. I want to taste lobsters and coconuts. I want to swim nakedly, get quite drunk in several wooden huts. Fun, 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 etc., etc. I'd like to have red blotches on my face, make a mess of my nose. I'd love to peel in every awkward place. Fun, fun, fun. And the final one that never made it, green lagoons, palm trees and cockatoos, local rum with mango juice, get things nicked and ruin all my shoes. Fun, fun, fun. There you are, original lyrics. Now the singer for the song was Jenna Russell, and I knew her because she was one of the lead characters in a musical I was writing that year, a musical called Girlfriends, uh, which I was doing at the Oldham Coliseum, and she was one of the main characters in it. And she had this very, uh, well, uh, great voice, very punchy, characterful, uh, slightly Ronnie Spectory voice. I want to no kind of rocket science about it. I happen to know X number of singers and I thought Jenna's got the voice for this. When I first wrote the song it was in a much more manageable key for her voice and uh, it was a tone lower uh, and then when we came to record it uh, I'd already put it up a tone so in other words instead of it was uh, which meant the end part of the song is very high for someone belting the, in their chest voice, as it's called. Uh, so Jenna was not exactly pleased with me for having done that, but she managed it all the same, and it sounds great. Fun, fun, fun. the beginning of the piece of the program for the opening titles um, it was an issue more to do with setting a mood and again I didn't want to say here comes a funny program I wanted to say we're in space miles from anywhere so we went for that very very simple uh, for the first two series that very very simple kind of pseudo epic space you know 2001 <laughs> Once we had our opening and our closing, uh, the normal thing is, of course, you've got your main tune and you're going to use that in various ways throughout the programme, in different moods and styles. Um, 
This is more or less still the case with programs, and one of the reasons people do this is because it glues the whole thing together. When we did the first two series, I think all that happened was that the director said to me, uh, can you just give us happy, sad, party time, you know, flying through space at high speed, um, being mad, can you give me just a whole different set of moods? And we just went into the studio for two hours with a little bandette of trumpet, drums and piano and one or two other instruments. It was all fairly low budget. Uh, and just did whole tons of stuff, little tiny little excerpts, different versions of the tune in different moods. And I just gave them like a shopping list and they took that and put it onto the programme at various points. As we went on, you know, into two, series two, three, four and so on, it was more precisely done and they would say, look, we've got a particular scene here that needs something or we want a link between two scenes, which is a change of mood or in this scene you know he's doing x y or z can you do something musically for that so it then became more tailor-made uh, one of the things about a long-running series like red dwarf is that you can't really anticipate what the writers are going to need at any later point uh, and you know it was quite fun each time hearing well this time we'd like a version of you know the neighbors theme for androids uh, or this time we're going to do a kind of high noon thing and you need to do that um, as it happens, these days, the rules on doing styles of music that are like other things are much stricter. Um, and I've got um, various other bits of music from, uh, and notes from the various series. I note here um, Androids, uh, which went like this, didn't it? Androids, everybody needs good androids. And we probably couldn't do androids. Uh, in the theme of, in the style of Neighbours now. I don't think that would be allowed. Androids, though we're only made of metal. Androids have feelings too. Etc. When I saw you for the first time, first time. <laughs> tongue-tied came along and um, you know the thing about every comic actor inside every comic actor there is a pop star dying to come out uh, and these three lads are no exception because tongue-tied was originally supposed to be just a moment in a script it wasn't supposed to be a full you know singing dancing number and it all got a bit if I may say so out of hand um, and what happened was Rob and Doug said that we got this Someone we'd like to have a go at. And I can't remember what the exact context of it was in the story, but it was a, it was a sort of a moment. So I came in the studio, into the rehearsals the next day. They'd written a lyric, which was a, very good, I thought. Very funny and clever. And I came in the next day, and uh, I, I had a demo of me singing it at the piano, just me at the piano, and an old-fashioned drum machine going... Doo, 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 doo. Yes, well, you make me I did them a backing track. And the idea at that point was that I had this thing that it would be more like a, like a Diana Ross song, which was more in keeping with the way we'd approach the music, in that not to try and make it sound like a song that would be in the charts that day. Um, and that it was a sort of, you know, whenever you are near me. So it was quite, you know, Diana Rossi. Uh, anyway, I did this, and anyway, they went up to Manchester, and then I, I spoke to Paul Jackson, I think, who said, uh, well, it's changing a bit, Howard. When I saw it, I must say, I was quite surprised. Uh, Danny and Craig uh, had got some mates in, and they wanted to do a different version of it, so they stayed up all night in a studio somewhere, uh, and recorded a different backing track for it, with a different rhythm and feel and everything to it. Um, which was fine by me, you know, it's their show and do what they like. 
Uh, and they went up and did it, and then added all this choreography and all sorts, you know, singing and dancing and extravaganza. Uh, and I thought it was Charlie Organs did the choreography, I think, and the dance was superb, and Danny's a great dancer. And, um, you know, it was a, obviously a hilarious thing to do. Although, if you want my honest opinion, I think that one of the things that happened to it was that Rob and Doug's lyric got lost in the midst of that um, dance number and in the mix that they did to make it, you know, funky and all that, it just became like a number you would see on top of the pops. And uh, it just lost its what was funny about it in the first place. And I think that was a shame. Oh, I'm begging on my knees. Sweet, sweet darling, listen, please. Understand me when I say. Because Danny did a version of it a bit later and released it as a single. So um, uh, I went, went into the office and said to Charles Armitage, who was at that point um, uh, running Noel Gay Music and Noel Gay TV were also doing the show, I went in one day for something else altogether and I said, whatever happened to Danny's um, you know, idea that he'd do a single of Tongue Tied? You know, he came and saw me once and I gave him the music charts and everything. I never heard anything more of it. Did it die a death? He said, no, it's number 20 in the charts. So I went down to HMV uh, right there and then and bought a copy of his single. Uh, it was the first song I'd ever written that had been in the top 20. <laughs> With the new opening for Series 3, we had the guitar version of the theme tune. And I didn't play it myself, I'm no guitar player. Um, but what I wanted to do was um, record the backing track, which we did with all the other instruments. And I said to the guitarist, look, um, he was a session player, a very good session player. I said, what I really want you to do is start playing the tune you know, in a normal sort of solo way. And then I suggested to him various things he could do, but I really wanted it to sort of get out of hand, to go a bit bonkers. And one of the strange things is, if you say to a professional musician, you know, play like you've gone mad, they can't really do it. Um, it always sounds, you know, beautifully honed, and they find a wonderful way of curling back into the right note instead of the wrong note and all that. Uh, and there's some little chip in their brains that won't allow them to play in a bonkers way. <laughs> I probably should have just gone onto the streets of London and found a nutter, you know, with a guitar and just said, be a nutter, and not even played him the track. In series three, uh, in the episode Backwards, I actually did all the Red Dwarf music cues backwards. Uh, and she wrote them out in all reverse order and recorded it all for that programme, and they were never used. Uh, and I think partly because Unless you actually hear the sound of, of a tape being played backwards, that sort of sound, um, people wouldn't recognise it as the backwards theme of Red Dwarf. It would just sound like music that happens to be in a different order of notes. You can see why they didn't, it didn't kind of make sense as incidental music. One of the nice things about doing a fourth series of a show where you've got a very well-known tune uh, as your theme is, of course, you can do it in lots of different styles. People still recognise it as the tune. And in the fourth series, we did the tune in different ways. And uh, one of the ways was a kind of Elvis-style one. I want to lie, And another one was Rimmer and his electric organ. Um, and what I was trying to do was find the naffest organ sound I could possibly find. Um, and I remember, you know, when I was younger, that there used to be little organs around called things like Wurses. And they had really funny names. They're probably German. 
Versi. It's Wednesday night. It's amateur Hammond organ recital night. Okay, take it away, Scutters. <laughs> I tried to find, you know, really enough electrical, and I couldn't really find anything bad enough. And then I thought, well, I'll have to make a sort of composite. And on one of my synthesizers, I made my own really, you know, versy uh, organ sound, and um, you know, to do his solo. Ace Rimmer was a good fun thing to do because uh, musically, you know, it's a more expensive, silly um, character to to do, and and obviously the idea then was to make him sound like a character from Top Gun, um, and you know I did a little parody of um, Take My Breath Away. Bring around for another pass. Please, Ace, don't go. I love you. Step up a motor, more girl. Smoke me a kipper. I'll be back for breakfast. <laughs> What people see in films when a great character, you know, and Tom Cruise is in his plane, is long bits of picture and action without dialogue. Uh, and that's where they put in the big numbers. And you hear great sweeping film themes, and the things just get carried away and off they go. And you're often asked as a TV composer to do something like that, to give that same feel to something in a TV programme. But they never give you the space to do that. They'll give you two seconds rather than 45. So they say, oh, can you just quickly, between that line and that gag, put in something that makes you feel like he's a Top Gun? Because uh, there's never the action, there's never the moment of just visual stuff in a TV comedy. You've created the Mutton Vindaloo Beast? Half man, half extra Indian curry? Using sitars and Indian instruments and things in the middle of all that. Uh, and you know what? I did that in my studio and sent it in uh, to Ed By and said, look, I've done this music for the Curry Monster, but I'm, I actually was not expecting them to use it because I thought it's so you know, nutty. Uh, and I sent it in and um, I didn't hear anything. And usually when you don't hear anything, it means, you know, it's not very good. Uh, and they don't want to tell you. So I sent it in and I didn't hear anything. And then anyway, I got a call ages later, I was on the next three programmes or something, and it was Ed, and he said, Curry Monster, fabulous, best sound in the whole thing. Well, 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 Sheriff. Fancy seeing a man of your sober disposition in a low-down drinking establishment. Now, here's a funny thing. Gunman of the Apocalypse, which I enjoyed doing enormously. Ding, 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 ding. And we did a, a version of the end music that came out of that um, sort of cowboy thing. That obviously required me to do more of a Western thing. And I think one of the great things which happened with Red Dwarf was this idea that they could time travel and go into other places and do those things, because there was another one which was a kind of Pride and Prejudice scene where they ended up and they were all having tea by a lake. Where on earth have dead Lizzie and Jane disappeared to such rudeness? I miss this! <laughs> uh, and that required a more kind of Mozart style sound and uh, all that was great fun to do because you could take your Red Dwarf theme and then turn it some other way. He's Donald, Donald, Donald Rimmer without him life would be much grimmer these hands so trim and no one slimmer he will never need a zimmer. Yeah I loved uh, Blue the episode because I loved the whole concept of Rimmer World I thought it was extremely funny and it was very well done as well on the programme um, so they came to me and said, look, we'd like to have this, you know, bonkers song that he sings, uh, um, that the machines all sing about Rimmer, uh, which was a great opportunity. And again, you know, we could have gone for a kind of Disney-style pop song, but I think that would have been wrong. It would have been wrong for Rimmer. So I went for more like, you know, kind of the police chorus. Uh, Arnold, 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 Rimmer. Uh, and they gave me, they gave me this lyric uh, uh, which was uh, <laughs> the silliest rhymes in it I think I'd ever seen. Um, you know, because they were running out of potential rhymes for Rimmer. Had things like, you know, he's something or other, you know, garden strimmer and a terrible swimmer or wonderful swimmer or I think I'm going now for dinner and things like this. It would, you know, the rhymes got madder and madder. And um, 
Anyway, so I thought, well, it required something pompous and, you know. Arnold, 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 Bernie, Bernie. Um, and it, uh, it seemed to work very well in the programme. And I actually, we did a lot of verses of it. I seem to have recorded a version with three or four verses. And in the end, it was cut right down for the programme version. Uh, it was one of my favourite moments in doing Red Dwarf was the Rimmer song. He's Arnold, 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 Rimmer, more reliable than a garden strimmer. He's never been mistaken for your Rimmer. He's not bald and his head doesn't glimmer. Chris rather sweetly said he would rather not sing it himself. Well, I was up for him doing it and I was happy to sit there with him and rehearse him and everything, but he was a bit shy to do that. He's kind of a mirror image of Craig and Danny in that respect, because give them any excuse to sing, they will obviously take it. Well, we are the smart party! <laughs> <laughs> I didn't come here looking for trouble. I just came to do the Red Dwarf Shuffle. He's smart. <laughs> it is unusual to have a full orchestra for a comedy series. Um, I mean, I guess, you know, it's partly a budgetary thing, because big orchestras are reasonably expensive, although they're about the same price as it costs to edit um, and to be in an edit suite for about an hour. <laughs> uh, so it's a question of priorities. Uh, if you want an orchestra, you can have one. And they do sound fantastic because it, it suddenly makes it sound like a film. Uh, and um, you don't often get the chance to do that. <laughs> Here is the orchestral score of Natural Born Rimmers. Um, as you can see, it's quite big. Lots of instruments. There you go, there's the strings down there, woodwind there, all the percussion stuff here. And um, this is when we had the full orchestra for Rimmer dropping out of the sky as in a World War II ace. And also here, in the same session, we recorded um, with the orchestra the music from Ticket to Ride of the Kennedy stuff, um, Kennedy assassination stuff. You see, that's the bit where Kennedy gets shot. Those, in a way, uh, pointed the way forward to a slightly different style for Red Dwarf, making it more filmic. Um, and I think that, you know, enhanced it enormously. I, I'm, I think that's a, I think episodes, I mean, series seven is a particularly good series for that reason, because it suddenly seems to be opening up into a slightly bigger thing. Um, and if I had a penny for every time, you know, someone had got in touch with me saying, you know, can I have a copy of the music from either of those two episodes, you know, I'd have a few quid. Uh, here's the roller music. Mm -hmm. 